Good morning and welcome to this Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes, featuring everything you need to know as you prepare for the trading day ahead. Uh, sorry for that uh, late start this morning, had just a little technical issue on my end, but uh, I'm here and we're going to get going, should be a good show. I'm um, going to mention here over the next couple of weeks a number of times, but I'm going to give you the sneak preview right now that uh, we will be having an event on Saturday, April 15th, and it's going to be the Market Outlook, a Market Outlook webinar. This is going to be a free event open to anyone. Uh, you will need to be in our community at Earnings Beats. We'll be talking about that more and more, but if you want to make sure you don't miss it, just simply um, go over to earningsbeats.com and sign up for our EB Digest, and I'll show you all that in uh, just a, a couple of minutes. Um, let's go ahead and jump in because we've got a lot to go over. I'll go through the uh, some of the futures with you in just a minute as well. But let me uh, get things set up. You should be looking at the screen showing a lot of charts from yesterday. I'm gonna get into that in just a minute. Um, so this morning, we do have futures pointing up. We got the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average, the futures there up 225 points. That's about seven tenths of 1%. S&P 500 futures up 34. That's 4,036. Uh, NASDAQ futures up 121 points. That's almost a, a full percentage points high, higher. So we are seeing a little bit of money, at least in the futures, rotating back toward the more aggressive NASDAQ. That's a good sign. Crude oil prices up more than 1% today, back over $74 a barrel. 10-year Treasury yield still on the move to the upside, up four-tenths of 1%, 3.61%. We'll look at that chart in just a minute, but we are right up against the 20-day EMA there. All right, moving into the action from Tuesday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average finished down 38 points, just barely down. Uh, S&P 500 down six points, again, just slightly more than, uh, you know, one tenth of one percent. NASDAQ down 53 points, so down almost a half percent. So we did see a little bit of weakness, relative weakness in the NASDAQ, and that's been going on for the last couple of days. Mid caps up seven points, so that was up about three tenths of one percent. Small caps up a point, uh, which was about one tenth of one percent. So it was a bifurcated market. Smaller stocks did better, value stocks did better. Looking at the Individual sectors, energy up one and a half percent, industrials up a half percent, materials up uh, just under a half percent. Those were th your three leaders from Tuesday. Communication services lost eight tenths of one percent, and healthcare lost six tenths of one percent. Those were your laggards. But overall, um, we had a nice rally in the final hour. That helped to really pick the market up because we were looking at some not so great action heading into that, but by the uh, end of the day, things looked much, much. All right, let's move on. I want to talk a little bit about the 10-year Treasury yield here. All right, so we're past the Fed meeting. Not a whole lot of economic reports out this week. Um, only one today. We do have the pending home sales coming out later today. And if you remember last month, now, this is a, the pending home sales is actually for the month of February, but the January report, if you remember, we saw a rise of 8.1% in this index. February, we're expected to rise, but only by 1%. Um, and in, I'll show you the uh, home construction index, <clears throat> because this is an index that's been going higher and higher. And I know, you know, I've, I've had some comments saying, well, yeah, rates are coming down. It's not inflation, it's, it's recession. Well, this is something I talked about months ago. I said, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have inflation fears, then we're going to have interest rate fears, and then we're going to have recession fears. All of it, the market's going to ignore and we're going to go higher. And so far, we've had the inflation fears. The Fed still talks about it a little bit, raised rates again this past week. Based on everything I'm seeing, the market's not concerned about inflation. So comments I've gotten, well, it's not inflation, it's recession. Let me ask you a question. If you're going into a recession, would you be buying home building stocks? Because home builders relative to the S&P 500 have been going up now 
since April of last year. It's been almost a solid year of relative outperformance by, con by uh, these home construction stocks. Makes no sense. I mean, if you're talking about a recession, we're going into a recession and things are going to be bad economically. Why would Wall Street be putting their money into home construction stocks? And if we're going into a recession, that means earnings are going to be coming down. Why would we be going into growth stocks? I mean, the biggest growth of them all is probably semiconductors. I mean, look at the relative strength of semiconductors since October. 52-week high we just hit. Trending higher. That certainly doesn't look like a recession and lower earnings ahead. Software. Software, you might say, well, yeah, it still hasn't broken out above the August high. But look at the relative strength in 2023. Straight up the first three months of this year. Moving to an 11 and a half month relative high versus the S&P 500. These are areas that would be getting roasted as you approach a recession. I don't see a recession. Look at unemployment. Look at initial jobless claims. None of that suggests anything to do with a recession. So I'm not buying into, I mean, I'll buy into the recession talk. Heck, it's going to be out there. Media loves fear. They're going to talk about it all they want. And it's going to drive a lot of people to sell. But I'm seeing a lot of accumulation in key areas of the market that would not confirm that the market's going lower. I think, and, and this is something I've talked about since May, June of last year, we're continuing, well, not as much this year, but some, we're seeing weakness in the morning since May, June of last year. But by afternoons, there's buying. Anybody who wants to sell in the morning, Wall Street will gladly take your money. Yesterday was another example. Down pretty big first half of the day, even all the way into maybe the last couple hours. And then the buying kicked in. We've seen that so many times over the past nine months. Wall Street was distributing. They were in the distribution mode January to May of last year. I've shown those charts. I'll show it again on April 15th. It was clear. There was selling throughout the day. Wall Street was getting out. Ever since then, it's been morning weakness followed by afternoon strength. Wall Street parading their analyst on the CNBC talking about how bad things are, while back at the home office, their market makers are just accumulating shares for themselves and for their institutional clients. That's been what's been going on. And if you want to see charts to prove it, I don't have time to go over everything today, but if you want to see charts to prove that, join me on April 15th because I'll be pulling that up and showing you pretty, it'll be crystal clear. I've written articles, Wall Street steals from us. Legal, it's all legal, but they steal from us. You call it whatever you want. Anyway, back to the 10-year treasury yield. This is the uh, update. Right now, we're at about 3.604. 20-day moving average is at 3.61. And if there's one thing that's been really confusing, it's probably been the bond market just because the yield, you know, we went back down and hit this low at uh, 340. And then we got down to this low at 337. And it looked like we were breaking down. Then we bounced back up. And then we went down a little bit below 337. Looked like another breakdown. Nope, right back up again. And then I thought, well, okay, maybe we'll get back up to that 390 area. Well, we went through, went above 4%. Looked like breakout. At that point, I was thinking, hey, the odds are we're going to go back to 430 to test the high from October. Nope, not in the cards. Right back down again. Friday, we went below all of these lows and went down to a low of 3.29 and change. Right before we've come rallying back the last four days, the yields finished on its high of the day. Four pretty solid hollow candles. Of course, today's early. We don't know where it's going to finish. But right now, another hollow candle. So it was another head fake. So all I can say right now about the bond market and about the yield is that we're in a trendless environment. I think it's pretty clear. Looked like we were trending down, then it looked like we were trending up, then down, then up, then down, now back up. We're doing nothing. 
We're right where we were four months ago. We're going above the moving averages, below the moving averages, above the moving averages, below the moving averages. The moving average crossed itself, had a death cross to the downside. And what happened after that? Rates been going right back up again. This is the definition of a trendless market. What I would look for in a trending market is where you go down below the moving averages, the moving average crosses below, we get that death cross, we test that 20 day, and then we roll back over again. If we see that and we go back down to new lows, that would be the signal of a trend like this, where you go up, you come down, you test the 20, you go up, you come down, you test the 20, you go up. That was a clearly an uptrend, 20 is above the 50. And it wasn't until we got up here, put in a negative divergence. That's when all of this sideways action has occurred. Now, what I can promise you is that if the bond market was worried about inflation, you wouldn't accept a 3.6% yield. You wouldn't accept a 4.3% yield. Bonds would be sold heavily and yields would be rising rapidly in an, a true long-term inflationary environment. This is not a long-term inflationary environment. It's not the 1970s. That's what the charts are telling me. I mean, if you want to listen to the media over the charts, that's up to you. But the charts are not saying anything like that. This, this uptrend here wouldn't have stopped. We wouldn't be sideways consolidating. Now, we go back up on the yield, get through three point, or excuse me, 4.30. Then you got something to talk about. Until then, inflation should just be squashed. Um, chart of the day. I wanted to go over and show you the chart of the day. This was actually featured in our Earnings Beats Digest this morning. If you'd like to have this emailed to you, we do the EB Digest Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you'd like to have it emailed to you, you can go over to earningsbeats.com, scroll down, name and email address is all it takes. Hit that subscribe button. No credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. But I fo focus on a lot of things, uh, mostly price chart related, sometimes seasonality. But usually I'm looking at candlesticks. We're looking at earnings. We're looking at gaps, uh, trend lines. We're looking at divergences. And today I was just talking a little bit about awareness. So things that you need to be successful as a trader. And one of the things you need to be good at is just being aware. And so I pulled up Caterpillar and I'm looking at the chart. And yeah, we've definitely, we're in a downtrend. We've hit a low here around 211, 212. And then we bounced back up, got to about 225. Notice the falling 20-day EMA right now is at 227. So we bounced off support. So I just simply said, hey, you know, we could go back up and test the recent high, 227. That's 227 is actually the moving average. The high is probably around 225. I mean, right in there, I wouldn't be surprised if the market moves up. And maybe we bust through. I mean, just because you go down below the moving average doesn't mean you can't go back up through it. But when you're trending down, I respect the moving averages until we get through them. So I'd be looking, if, if I owned Caterpillar, if I tried to play a support test and it's like, okay, 215, I'm getting in. Uh, and I think it's going to go to 225. Well, if it hit 225, I'd take my money and run. I would not be looking to see if I can get through the 20 day. Let it go through the 20 day. You can always get back in later. But as a trader, you got $10 profit if it gets to 225. Take the money and run. What I'm aware of and what I'm thinking about here though, is let me, let me, I'm going to annotate here, show you a couple things. So with earnings back in at the end of October, you can see that big gap up. And you can see the spike in volume on this gap. And once we gapped up and started moving higher, notice when we pulled back, we didn't go back below the top of the gap. Sometimes your folks are looking at, um, you know, waiting for a stock to fill its gap. And some will, some won't. Some will take off and just keep going. You can wait forever and a gap won't be filled. These runaway gaps or breakaway gaps, sometimes they go and they come back to the top of gap support, but they don't always go back to the bottom of gap support. So that's why I always draw that distinction on the charts showing both. If it's a gap up 
and we don't really have any follow through, then I tend to look at gap support to the downside as being the key gap support. But once you have a gap up on volume and you keep going higher, I start to look at this area as your key gap support and maybe even the intraday low. So normally when I would annotate a chart on something like this, this is how I would do it. There's your gap up. That's the opening bell. Went up, came back down pretty close to it. Here was the intraday move. So you got you gapped up on big volume. Normally, when you gap up, market makers are on the other side, which is why you expect to fill the gap. Well, we got down to this level, which was around 206, 207. And that was as far as market makers could take it before a lot of buying kicked in. So these are the two key levels, the open and the intraday low, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if it breaks both these levels, then yes, the next move would be that gap support. But I've seen plenty of stocks come down to this area and not go and fill the gap and turn back to the upside. So anyway, in this, I'm looking at this as kind of the support area. And if we were to go down one more time, you can see that the PPO starting to move to the upside. If we go down one more time, it's possible that we will see a slightly higher PPO, especially if we go up first for a couple of days. I'm looking for this PPO to turn up a little bit. And then when we pull back, I think it may just flatten out. And it could be very similar to what we saw back here in July. So check this out. Here was your move down, lower lows on the close. And look at the MAC, or the, well, PPO, MACD would look the same. The, the difference between the MACD and the PPO, I used to always use the MACD. The MACD looks at the difference between two EMAs, usually the default 12 day or 12 period and 26 period EMAs. It looks at the difference in terms of dollars. The PPO looks at that difference between the 12 period and 26 period EMAs in terms of percentages. So if you look at a, the MACD and the PPO, they're gonna look almost identical. But this is in terms of percent. So this is telling us right now that the 12-day uh, EMA is roughly 3% below the 26-day. Now, if you looked at the uh, MACD, it would show you the difference in price between the two moving averages. That's the only difference. So anyway, I like to use the PPO. The PPO is good because you can compare the, the momentum in a $1,000 stock with the momentum of a $10 stock because it's based on percentages. If you look at the MACDs, you can't compare them. It's based on price action. So of course, when you have big moves in a $1,000 stock, the price difference between your moving average is gonna be a lot more, right? So anyhow, I like to use the PPO because you can, you can compare um, among not only various stocks, but you also can compare the same stock to itself at an earlier point in history. Let's say a stock 10 years ago was trading at $10 and now it's trading at $500. You can't compare MACDs. You can't compare the momentum today to the momentum 10 years ago using a MACD because the price is a lot higher now. So the MACD is going to be skewed. PPO, however, is percentage-based. That's why I think the PPO is better than the MACD. Just in a couple of instances that I mentioned. Otherwise, they're, they're identical. But anyway, if we move back down, what I was saying in the newsletter this morning article, uh, 210, if we get back down to 210, 211, 210, that's going to start to look pretty interesting, especially if we have a positive divergence because we're at a major support level too. Now, we're not down there now, but this is just simply being aware. I look at a chart and I see that, oh, PPO is starting to turn up, price action's going up. What if Caterpillar were to have one more move to the downside. So what you could do is simply go in to stock charts. And if you go to the dashboard, you could go down to alerts and you could just put in an alert. And when it hits, it triggers, it'll come across the top of your screen. If you set it up so that you get a site notification, I'm on stock charts most of the day. So that's what I usually do. And I also give a text uh, I want it by uh, text message as well, in case I'm, a, I'm out. But you can set all that up. You don't have to sit there and watch it all day long. 
And so that's the beauty of using stock charts and organizing your thinking and using awareness to your advantage. All right, again, go over to earningsbeats.com. That's plural, earningsbeats.com. It's our homepage. Scroll down, check that out. If you want to try our service for 30 days, that's also no cost, but you do have to give a credit card for that. And we will notify you before we charge you at the end of the month. We'll, we'll let you know, hey, your subscriptions, your, your free trial is expiring. We don't want you to pay if you don't want the service. Um, but we think we're worth it. Anyhow, check that out over at earningsbeats.com. All right, S&P 500. So I want to point out a couple of things because people are always asking me, why do you think the market's going up? And I don't get that just here online with people, you know, members. I think most members have followed my work for quite a while now and they kind of get me. They understand where I'm coming from and they've seen enough positive results to believe in the things that I follow, things that I have learned over the years, the research that I've done. But then there are those maybe on the EB Digest who are just getting to know us a little bit, or maybe some of you follow us on, following us on YouTube, the stream here. Uh, we do live stream Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and maybe some of you are seeing me for the first time and you're like, why in the heck would you think the market's going to go up? With all these issues out there, how could the market go higher? Well, that's going to be the topic, well, somewhat the topic on Saturday, April 18th. When I give you the market outlook, I'm going to be looking forward. But in order to look forward, you have to take a look at some of the things that have been happening. And so that's what that whole uh, event is going to be about. So again, make sure you subscribe to EB Digest and you will you won't miss it for sure. We'll send out room instructions to everybody on our EB Digest. Um, but I'll keep mentioning it over the next couple of weeks. So here's a chart of the S&P 500. Now, for me, it's... I mean, is the S&P 500 going up or going down? Obviously, that's a pretty big point, right? Price action. If the S&P 500 is going up, that's a good thing, especially if you're invested. It means you're making some money, hopefully. And if the S&P is going down, that's a bad thing. That's pretty simple. That's straightforward. And that's what you're going to hear S or the uh, CNBC crew harp on all the time. We're up, we're down. They got a headline for everything. 10 o'clock, the market could be down 200 points, and they'll tell you why, exactly why. They'll give you the reason. But then it's up 200 points by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you know what? They got a reason for that, too. They got a reason for everything. Most of it's called clickbait. Rarely, I mean, I stopped watching most media, if I'm going to go in and look at anything media, it's you sometimes online, I will flip it into CNBC. I don't watch the show because I think that is absolutely pure a waste of time. I think you just kind of get in there listening and you go down a rabbit hole. And if anything, it probably confuses you more than anything. Um, but if I'm if I need some information, a lot of times in the morning, if I'm looking, I just want to get a quick glimpse. I got my phone right next to me. I wake up in the morning. First thing I do, CNBC, what are the future is doing? First thing I do every morning. So I don't ignore it, but I don't pay attention to the articles. And I certainly am not going to watch the show during the day. The only thing that I have any interest in watching on CNBC is if Warren Buffett were to come on. Um, there are a couple technicians. I really like Carter Worth. Um, you know, so there are some that I would I would tune in. But for the most part, I'm going to go over to Bloomberg instead of CNBC. I think they're a little bit more objective, um, but I'm really not following them either. I, you know, I kind of march to the beat of a different drummer when it comes to the stock market. I do my own research. I, I try to figure out what makes the stock market tick. So let me just go over a quick chart here with you. Here's the S&P 500 going up in 2021. And then here is the move to the downside, which I called right back. Actually, we went down a little bit. It was probably right around 4,700. I don't remember exactly where we were when we did Market Vision 2022. It was on Saturday, January 8th. It's going to be very similar. It's going to be like a little mini Market Vision that I do on April 15th. But this pullback right here, um, we, had, we had not really broken down below anything at the point we had the Market Vision. And I said at the time, we had potential to go down to 3,500 to 3,800. 
we were sitting at 4,600 or 4,650, 4,700. I don't know exactly where we were. But I said, we could go down to 3,500, 3,800 in the next three to six months. That was my call. Six months later, five and a half months later, middle of June, we were in that 3,500 to 3,800 range. Let me show you one of the things that I looked at back then. I look at what I consider sustainability ratios. Now, I look at them to either support or refute what's going on in the, on the S&P 500. So what I, when the S&P is going up, I love my ratios to be going up with it. It just tells me that there's a really good chance that the market's going to keep going higher. And the reason for it is these ratios are all set up with growth being first versus kind of more value second. So if the market's going up, it's usually a pretty good sign of our economy. And you've probably heard the stock market is one of the best leading indicators of our economy. So when the stock market's going up, if our economy is strengthening, growth stocks should grow their earnings really fast. That's what they do. They grow in an in a growth environment when the market's doing well, when the economy's doing well, that's when growth stocks do well. They outperform value in most, I'm not going to say all, but in most periods when the market is going higher, secular bull markets, growth crushes value. So when the market's going up, I like to see my growth ratios going up. This is the NASDAQ versus the S&P 500. NASDAQ's a little more aggressive. Consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. Discretionary, much more aggressive. IWF, IWD, this is uh, large cap growth versus large cap value. Then I have three growth versus value indexes, large cap growth um, index versus large cap value, mid cap growth versus mid cap value, small cap growth versus small cap value. And then down at the bottom, I do transports, which tend to do much better in a, in a strong economy or a strengthening economy, and then utilities, which are more defensive and tend to be better performers when the market's not doing well and when the economy is not doing as well. So what we saw into November and early December were ratios for the most part that supported the move to the upside. The mid cap and small cap growth had topped a little earlier and started rolling over, but just about everything else topped in November or December. When we made the final move up beginning of January, look at all the ratios down, 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 down. As we put in the final high, Wall Street was saying bye-bye to all the growth stocks and moving into more defensive value stocks. This didn't mean that the market had to go lower, but what it's telling us is it is raising a big red flag and saying, you know what? We're going higher. That looks good on the chart. If, you, if you're trading or if you own the SPY, you're making more money. That's wonderful. But this doesn't tell you the beneath the surface signals. That's where this comes in. That's where these signals come in. Now, when we went down into June, you can see the ratio started to move up, even though we kept going down May to June. This is when I called the bottom in June of last year. And I can't believe people on YouTube. I mean, it. some of the responses I get back saying, oh, he's going to call another bottom. He's going to call another bottom. I called two bottoms last year, right here and right here. I said, you're getting a second chance. I think it might have been September 27th or 28th. But I said, you're getting a double bottom. You're getting a second chance. Those were the only two bottoms I called. Where are we now? I love it when folks on YouTube are like, oh, he's going to call another bottom. Well, hey, if it works out as well as the last two, I'd love to. I mean, I do think on an intermediate term basis or maybe short to intermediate term basis, I do think this is a bottom right in here. I don't think we're going back below that. I think we're getting ready to, to move higher. Market just opened, by the way, so I'll wrap this up in just a second. But this is one huge, look at what's going on right now. The S&P 500 in February and March went down, but I see the ratios continuing to go up. This one, the XLY XLP is pulled back. 
That's a growth versus value ratio soaring in 2023. IWF, IWD soaring in 2023. Large cap versus uh, or large cap growth versus large cap value soaring in 2023. Mid cap growth versus mid cap value straight up. Small cap growth versus small cap value straight up. Transports pulled back in March, but we still have an uptrend where we had a bottom back in September. Now, again, these don't necessarily make the S&P 500 go higher, but Wall Street is positioning to go higher. If the S&P breaks out, there's your con confirmation. That's what we're looking for. And I have other signals telling me we're going to make it, but don't have, I've run out of time. Again, we'll talk about more of this on April 15th, but don't follow blindly what's going on in the S&P 500. And certainly don't follow CNBC blindly. Um, let's take a look. Well, let's just go in and take a look at what's going on in the market. We'll just wrap it up for today. Um, really good action. So we got the Dow Jones up uh, 236 points. S&P up 39. NASDAQ up 149. NASDAQ on a relative basis, showing a little bit of muscle today. That has not been the case the past few days. Uh, really, since the Fed, we started to see a little bit of a drop off, which, hey, the NASDAQ had crushed the S&P 500 and the Dow throughout much of 2023. Pulling back for a few days, I got no problems with that. I think as we go into earning season and toward April, this is the time, starting today, by the way, starting today, I've told members this is the day where we start to see outperformance. That doesn't mean that I'm not saying that this is going to continue and that all of a sudden a faucet turns on and stock market's hot again. But historical tendencies tell us that this is the time where we tend to make a pre-earnings run. Now, all the way really through the middle part of May, but especially now through about April 18th to the 20th, the next three weeks, history tells us we want to be long. So in addition to everything else I was talking about, seasonality favors being in this market right now. So we'll see. Let's see how we finish today. Let's see how we roll for the next few weeks, but definitely mark your calendar again, April 15th. That's going to be a really big event. I think you'll enjoy it. If nothing else, you don't have to agree with me, but if nothing else, maybe it'll give you something else to consider besides all the garbage you hear on CNBC and everywhere else in the media. Trust me, I can point out many times where those folks don't do any research. They just, the biggest one will be next month when everybody starts saying go away in May. I got a lot of numbers I'll give you about May and June. You don't want to go away in May. But hey, it rhymes, it sounds pretty. It, you know, you get a lot of clicks. And so for that reason, it works for media outlets. Anyway, I'm done ranting. Have a great day. And uh, let's see what happens the rest of the day. We'll be, uh, I'll be out later today with our daily market report for all of our members. Um, so that'll probably be out early this afternoon. Anyway, have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.